Thank you for joining us today. That's, you know, this is kind of an exciting topic that just the feedback we've gotten, phone calls, emails that Jimmy and I and the rest of our team have gotten, it's kind of a hot topic, so we wanted to hurry up and, and uh, put this out for you. Um, you know, it kind of starts off as, uh, what's all the fuss? You know, what are you talking about all this, you know? Um, and parked equipment, that's uh, one of the biggest ones, you know, we're talking to, to fleets right now is, um, we got new trucks parked, we got trade trucks, um, you know, there's always, you know, peaks and valleys of freight, so you may have, you know, lack of drivers, you may have a shortage of freight. Um, another one I was talking to a gentleman today was, um, may have damaged trucks. They're sitting there waiting to go to a body shop or, you know, in the body shop for an extended period of time. But many reasons. Um, not just tractors, we have trailers. Uh, same situation, you know, new trailers have just been delivered. You know, trailers you're uh, waiting to sell or trade in, um, in service, but, you know, don't have a customer form right now, especially, you know, uh, trailer leasing companies. that you got to have stock so that when somebody does, you know, need trailer, you have them. Um, so they're sitting there extended periods of time. Another one we see a lot of, uh, more and more fleets are getting into box trucks uh, for the home delivery type thing. And if you look at a lot of the bodybuilders, there's, uh, just a sea of cabin chassis sitting there. And they may be there for weeks or months um, waiting on a box. And then you also got to wait for a delivery, someone to come and get them. Uh, maybe having to sit and wait because of, you know, pilot reviews or customer inspections. So lots of sitting. And the other one that's, you know, really big right now is school buses. Um you know, same with any other type of fleet. You got, you know, new buses that have just arrived and you may not put them in until, you know, a, a certain time of the year, long weekends, you know, holiday breaks, summer vacations. And you got the, the old buses that you're either, you know, going to go to auction or you may sell them privately. But again, things are parked. Anytime they're parked, they have parasitics. But what's causing all the, the new emphasis on this? Something you've probably heard of, you know, the whole uh, corona epidemic or, or pandemic we're, we're fighting right now has impacted so many things uh, that uh, not only has freight for a lot of customers, you know, really suffered and people have hundreds of trucks they've never had parked before, suddenly parked. If you look at the, the school bus industry uh, or school bus fleets is suddenly school was let out months ago. So instead of having a three month uh, summer vacation, it's turned into a six, seven month vacation. I'm not sure it's really a vacation, but um, no matter what, we do have buses parked for, for long periods of time. And before we've always kind of, you know, had this, it's been kind of a, a nuisance, but now it's really become a, a huge deal. And it's only gonna get worse, the longer stuff is parked. So um, we wanted to just kind of spend some time and go over it and uh, go over parasitics and things you can do to, to manage this equipment. Absolutely. Uh, so now we, we talked about the whys, you know, why we have these parked vehicles. Um, I'm going to kind of go into, you know, what are parasitic loads, um, some ways to uh, test for par parasitic loads, and some things you can do um, to your battery or your electrical system to, um, to properly maintain it. Um, so parasitic loads, um, you can look at TMC Recommended Practice 140A. Again, um, mention the uh, resources section uh, or the resource widget. Uh, this will be located there. Um, but a TMC RP 140A states, a key off parasitic load is defined by any current which is drawn from the vehicle battery or battery pack by an electrical or electronic device while the engine and the ignition switch are off. So everything off, just vehicle sitting. Uh, the electrical or electronic device may be actively on or may even draw power when not active or switched off. So how are we gonna measure these parasitic loads? A Couple different ways you can go about doing this. Um, you can use a, your multimeter, the ammeter function of your multimeter. Um, the one thing you wanna make sure you do first is there's a, a fuse inside that, that multimeter that you don't wanna, um, you don't wanna blow that fuse. So, Real simple, take you, uh, uh, make you up a little homemade you know, 10 amp inline fuse. Um, very simple, very cheap to make. Remove the ground cable of that circuit um, and place that 10 amp fuse assembly in series. If that fuse, that 10 amp fuse blows, probably shouldn't use that meter 
um, when performing that test. So it'll prevent you from, uh, you know, just some frustrations with blowing that 10 amp fuse. It'll save you a lot of time. And if you don't remember from our multimeter classes when we talk about this, um, those little uh, plastic fuses for that fuse holder, those are cheap. If you do something foolish and blow your multimeter fuse, those are pretty expensive. So it's just a good way to protect it. Absolutely. So to perform this test using the inline meter, um, you got to properly set up your meter first. And I've got a meter here. You want to take your red lead. Um, I don't know if everybody can see that, but just take your red lead and move it over to the, uh, the 10 amp port on your meter. Then you want to make sure you set up your uh, meter, turn the rotary dial to um, amps DC. Um, so make sure your meter is properly set up first. And then place your red lead on the terminal of the cable and place your black lead on the battery post. You want to make sure and weave that, um, that 10 amp inline fuse there while you're, reading, while you're doing this. Um, otherwise, you're going to, um, if you remove it, you're going to get a lot of that inrush current. Things are going to have to restart um, and wake up, and your current's going to be a lot higher. So um, another good thing about this is you can see I'm um, with my meter um, on the uh, negative post and the red lead on the ground cable. I'm reading 1.27 amps, um, just an example. Um, so half of it's going through that fuse, um, and half of it's going through the meter. Um, so if I move over to the next slide, now I'm reading 2.53 amps, you know, just an example. So it's going, again, um, every, everything in the electrical system goes in a circle. So what comes out of the battery must go back to the battery. So it's um, going through the load, uh, through the negative cable, through the, the meter, and then back to the battery. So very quick and easy way to, uh, um, to test the uh, for parasitic loads using an inline ammeter. Uh, another really easy way to do it is um, a clip-on ammeter. Uh, one good thing about a clip-on ammeter, you don't have to break the circuit. We talked in uh, previous slides on the inline ammeter. You do have to break the circuit there. Um, so using a clip-on ammeter, uh, you don't have to risk the uh, everything waking up and, and loads changing during that time period. You can simply clip this around the uh, that ground cable, um, and it uses a magnetic uh, field and measures that current flow without breaking that system. Uh, one thing to note on this, though, when and, and a lot of times when we in our industry we deal with very low current when when things are sitting, you know, clock radios, memory. Uh, we're talking about milliamps. So to get the best resolution out of a meter, uh, a clip-on ammeter, it's best to use a milliamp clamp. Um, they also make a a 40 to 400 amp scale uh, clip-on ammeter. Um, but if you want to get the best resolution, I would stick with a, a milliamp clamp. It all has to do with the shielding of that jaw and the electronics of it. That um, a inductive ammeter is never going to be as accurate as the uh, what's referred to as the shunt type meter inside the multimeter. But if you use you know a clip on ammeter that's really designed for milliamps, it is going to be much more accurate. They cost a lot more than the standard clip on ammeter, but it's the, the shielding that's in the jaws and everything else trying to give you as accurate of a reading as possible. But like Jimmy was saying, why that's so important is you're not making and breaking that circuit, so you're not waking up all those electronics. You know, for example, and we're going to talk about it a couple slides later, is uh, telematics. You know, most telematics will usually have three stages of power consumption. If it's actually up and transmitting, looking for messages or sending message, it's going to be a much higher load. If it's just in standby mode, it's going to be a lower load. If it, you know, depending upon how a fleet has it programmed in that piece of hardware, it may go into a sleep mode. Well, if you disconnect and reconnect it, you're going to wake everything up. So, ooh, I got a, this huge load. So, well, give it an hour and see what it does. So, with the, the milliamp, you can avoid a lot of that frustration. Absolutely. So, we've talked about ways to test for parasitic loads. Um, so now we're going to go into calculating these parasitic draws. And one thing to remember, the, the calculation for amper hours is amps times time. So first off, we're going to look at kind of the basic, the cab and chassis. Uh, we really don't have a whole lot of loads. Uh, you're just sitting with a, 
a, a cab and no box yet. Um, just waiting to be upfitted with a, a box. Um, so some of those loads, you know, kind of in general, we say drivetrain, that's just kind of encompassing all ECUs. Um, calculate about 0.2 amps. Uh, clock radio, uh, about 0.1 amps. Um, and really that's about it on a, in a uh, cabin chassis. So add all those up together, you got 0.3 amps. So we look at, you know, that cabin chassis sitting for one week. Again, when I said amps times time, so we've got 168 hours in a week, um, times that 0.3 amps, that's 50.4 amp hours that were taken out of that battery pack. And whether it's one battery, two batteries, that's how much we're taking out of that, that bucket of energy. So part for just one, one week, pulled 50.4 amp hours from that, that battery. A typical Group 31 battery um, is about 100 amp hours. Um, so 100 amp hours minus the 50.4, that's 49.6 amp hours remaining less in that battery pack. So that's less than 50%. Add two batteries, three batteries, however many batteries, um, you can do the calculations there. So two, two batteries, 200 amp hours, um, bringing that battery pack down to less than 75%. Again, this is all assuming it's a brand new battery, the battery's at 100% state of charge. It, it totally changes the numbers um, if the batteries are at a much lower discharge state. Next one we'll talk about a trailer. Um, and we kind of start off as kind of the, the fewer batteries and everything. Um, you know, one or two battery type situations. That's why we start off with the cabin chassis. Now we're going to do trailers. Because again, you're talking about a reefer that has one battery. Um, Again, telematics of some sort, you know, pulling off that battery, temperature monitoring system. There's all kinds of things. We're just giving you some examples today of, of common loads. Uh, but almost all the time, they are coming off that reefer battery. Uh, and that doesn't count some of the, the, the high loads that, you know, a lot of times we'll see people do like uh, cargo lights. But for now, just for, for some easy calculations, telematics at 0.25, cargo monitor at 0.2. Um, the reefer, again, it's got its own ECU. Um, 0.15, so a total of 0.6 amps. No big deal, right? It's less than an amp. Why do I have a problem? In 24 hours times that 0.6 amps, that's only 14.4 amp hours, you know, over one day. But if you take that in that trailer park for a week, that's now, again, we did the math before, is, you know, 168 hours times that 0.6, that's 108 amp hours. Now, if we do the math and subtract it from what we have available, uh, again, one group 31 battery, you subtract the 14.4, uh, so you still have 85.6. You know, easy math says you still got 85% of that battery left, no harm, no foul. Mm -hmm. You know, it can handle that. But look at that next one where you leave that trailer park for a week. You've taken more out than that battery even had. You've taken that battery down to nothing. It is dead. It's a boat anchor. It doesn't mean it can't come back, you know, but you're not going to do it in a timely manner. You're going to have to, you know, probably take that battery out of the reefer, run it through a recharge program, low test it, and, you know, then you can use it in another trailer, you know, two weeks from now when another one was totally dead. But no matter what, you have a piece of equipment that's now not ready to go out and service if someone calls. Tractor loads, another example. Um, and this is just some of the uh, some of the common loads that are on a tractor. Your telematics, uh, again, just in general, kind of uh, did some general calculations, 0.25 amps. Um your cooler, refrigerator, you know, two amps. Uh, again, drivetrain ECUs. That's kind of, you know, taking all ECUs. Uh, 0.15 amps. Uh, just leaving your inverter on, um, just by itself. 0.4 amps. Um, and a lot of the telematic systems um, come with a tablet, so that tablet alone is about two amps. Um, so at, again, add all those together. It's three amp, three amp draw. Um, over an eight-hour rest period, um, again, amps times time, that's eight times three, um, 24 amp hours you've taken out of that battery pack just in a rest period. Uh, over the weekend, um, you know, 72-hour period, 216 amp hours taken out of that battery pack. Again, it's all the same math. Um, so you can see, um, just over that Eight-hour rest period, I've taken 376 amp hours out of that. That's how much is remaining in that battery pack. 
Over the weekend, 184 amp hours remaining. All assuming that, again, all assuming 100%, 100% state of charge uh, and brand new batteries. So it all adds up. And one thing, go back to that previous slide, uh, when we talk about those loads and you know, refer to this as a rest period. That doesn't account, you know, driver doing anything else. This is, you know, driver's not in the truck, it's just parked for the weekend or he, he brought it home and Absolutely. parked in his driveway or whatever. Nothing else is on. You know, driver's not watching TV or, you know, cooking anything. That's just parasitic loads staying on. Yeah, everything we're talking about is, just like Larry said, is no interaction and just vehicles, equipment, sitting. Last one we're going to talk about, though, is school buses. And this is, again, a huge one right now because, you know, all the things that have happened. I mean, and school bus fleets have always suffered from uh, truck sitting all summer. That if it sits long enough, I don't care how small that load is, if it sits long enough, you're going to be dead. It doesn't matter if you get shot with a cannon or you get shot with a BB gun. If you die, you die. So uh, these are, again, some pretty common uh, loads that are on school buses today, and there's actually a lot more. Um, so we're trying to do a, a, even just a bare minimum of loads left on with how it has an impact. But a camera at 0.15 amps, child monitoring system, you know, and again, drivetrain ECs. And again, these are conservative. Comes up to half an amp. Uh, 10 amps, half an amp, five amp hours. Not a big deal. Um, weekend, 72 hours times five amps, or excuse me, 0.5 amps, 36 amp hours. Now, if you look at typical school bus, they usually use three batteries. Um, smaller engines, you know, don't have nearly the cranking requirements, so most of them run um, three Group 31. Some still use a big old uh, Group 8D battery, um, but still roughly 300 amp hours of energy. That five amp hours overnight or, you know, the 10-hour uh, break, still have 295. Weekend, 36, still have 264. Not that big a deal, but again, when we look at school buses, take that same math and you park a truck instead of for three days you park it for nine days because spring break or christmas vacation you know now you may be looking at 14 days um so that little load suddenly becomes a huge issue or for another example during this time period with the with the uh virus and everything sitting a lot longer so um yeah who knows when those bus can be started absolutely. before they may at least get used some for um if uh summer school programs or activities or whatever in summer they may get rotated and get driven some but some of these buses are not going to be moved for seven eight nine months maybe so we have a take a short little break here for a poll question um the question is what would what would discharge a battery more Starting an engine 10 times, so 15 seconds times 12 amps. Leaving the refrigerator on over the weekend, so that'd be 72 hours times 4 amps. Or leaving the lights on during a delivery, so 2 hours times 40 amps. We'll give you a little bit of time to uh, submit your answer. There's a little bit of delay here, so we're going to make sure we give you plenty of time and give the computer time to, to tally them all up. Then we'll go into a little bit more detail on the, the different scenarios. All right. That should be enough time. So, and also, too, don't forget, if you have any questions, please don't uh, hesitate to, to key those in at any time. So we got the results in. So 19% say starting the engine 10 times. Uh, 15 seconds times 12 amps, 61.9% uh, leaving the refrigerator on over the weekend, uh, then another 19% leaving the lights on during a delivery. And the answer is, yes, the refrigerator. Um, we really need to change that and quit calling it a refrigerator because every time you, you know a, a driver has a, a dead truck on the lot, technician goes out there and says, what would you leave on? Nothing. <laughs> and guess what they find plugged in? refrigerator so that's kind of a, a conditioned response so we need to change that but um yes um it's actually the smallest load but it's the longest period of time and it's that that little load left on long enough is going to do more damage or whatever than cranking now 
cranky everybody looks at because they see the, the high amount of current. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is a ton of current, but it's such a short period of time. It's not very many amper hours. But that refrigerator is just, you know, uh, terrible on batteries. And that's a, the thing fleets suffer all the time is, you know, those loads left on over and over. Um, and especially, you know, the refrigerator, they get used a lot in uh, summer and cycles of battery a lot. And you wind up with weak batteries, and the first time it turns cold, suddenly, oh, my batteries are bad. No, they're not. Summer and all the abuse you did, now wintertime just what made them actually show up. Yeah. So this is just a little chart showing showing those levels of discharge using all those uh, different scenarios, starting, uh, leaving lights on for a long period of time or, or refrigerator. Um, this was just a chart we got from Odyssey. You know, a little bit different than a uh, battery that most people are familiar with. This is a thin plate technology battery. But we wanted them to, to tell us, you know, give us, you know, some examples or, or some way people can understand what depth of discharge does to the life of a battery. And if you take a battery and you just barely cycle it, that battery will last forever. But the, the lower you take it over and over, the shorter it's going to be. So you can see how that battery life just falls off. Uh, based on how low you take it. So it's kind of an interesting graph to uh, to really show you the, the ramifications of deep discharge on batteries. Yeah, batteries don't have a conscience. They don't know where they start. So you started at 50% and cycled at 50%. It was like taking a paper clip and, you know, bending it back and forth. Um, you got, you're doing it at 100% state of charge. It's going to happen over a long period of time. You do it at a lower state of charge, that, uh, that paper clip's gonna break a lot faster. So we have another poll question that came in here. Uh, what is the reach rate of a flooded cell battery at 14 volts uh, when the temperature is at zero degrees Fahrenheit? Uh, your options are 10 amps per hour, five amps per hour, two amps per hour, or a battery will charge the same regardless of temperature. Can you give you some time to Think about that and key it in. We had a couple questions of coming in. Um, uh, just a couple comments, one question. Uh, one question was, uh, do you have a calculation that will tell us how long an installed uh, battery will last, you know, if it's disconnected? And we'll come back to that here a little bit more when we talk about some of the solutions and options. Yeah, we have a slide just for, for that. Um, that should be enough time, so we'll go to the results. So we have 5.3% 5. 5 say 10 amps per hour. 21% say 5 amps per hour, 55% say 2 amps per hour, and then 18% a battery will charge the same regardless of temperature. And the correct answer is 2 amps per hour. Batteries are like me. They don't like to work when it's cold. Um, and, you know, batteries just don't want to take a charge. Uh, so uh, when you're flat regulated at 14 volts, that is as much as a flooded cell uh, lead acid battery is going to take. Now, I always get some pushbacks as well. You know, my car died the other day, went out and jump started it, didn't have any problem. Well, where's the battery on your car? It's under the hood. You're going to get engine heat. It's going to warm up. It's going to, you know, take that charge. With school buses, um, you know, over the road trucks, whatever, those batteries and the alternator are in a totally different environment, and those batteries are never going to warm up. Uh, plus, when you talk about automotive, uh, the alternators in automotive applications have what's called a thermistor in them. So they will actually vary the voltage based on temperature. So in the middle of the summer when it's very hot, the voltage regulator setting will go down. Winter time when it's cold, the voltage regulator will go up. You know, it's, it's all things that we don't overcharge batteries in heat and we don't undercharge batteries in winter time. So, uh, but traditional truck, yes, 14 volts is what your limitation is. And those batteries are only going to take two amps an hour. So kind of going into the, the um, uh, this is a, a chart here, a comparison chart on battery state of charge. Um, 
some misconceptions on you know what is a fully charged battery. Some you know, we get calls all the time, you know, working with technicians. You know, my battery's at 12.4 volts. Well, or 12.2. That's a discharged battery. So understanding what those voltages are and those states of charge is pretty is very important. Um, and looking at AGM batteries versus flooded cell batteries, they're different. Uh, they're on different levels. You know, 100% state of charge AGM is 12.8 versus uh, a flooded cell battery is 12.65. So uh, knowing uh, what those state of charges are is very important. And that's one of the biggest things that you know you have to understand is state of charge. That when all, we talk about all these different uh, scenarios, the the key is. If you are going to park a vehicle for an extended period of time, um, for whatever reason, is before you park it against the fence or the back lot or whatever, those batteries have to be in a good state of charge. If not, you're starting two bricks high of a full load, and you're you got a, a recipe for failure there. So, um, you know, we've talked about all the uh, the the who's what's. You know, and now it's we're talking about some of the solutions. So yeah, so kind of to segue off Larry, uh, you know, battery charging. What would be the most opportune time to charge those batteries when no one's in it, when it's just sitting? So take advantage of that time and, and get those batteries up to a full state of charge uh, or as close to a full state of charge as possible. Um, just like filling up for, you know, with gas before you leave on a big trip. Um, you wouldn't leave on a um, quarter of a tank or a half uh, empty tank of, of fuel. So. Give that electrical system a fighting chance to survive. Charge those batteries. And another thing, too, is, you know, think about, you know, it comes up a lot of times, too, is if you buy new equipment, whenever it gets delivered, you ought to get, you know, batteries 100% state charged. If you've got, you know, trucks being piggybacked in, pretty much guarantee you the one that was driving is going to come in a good state of charge. The two or three that were piggybacked, guess what? They're probably going to be fairly discharged. So before you do something with them, make sure they're charged. You know, I myself would you know make sure whoever I bought them from made sure they were charged. Why should you have to do it? Yeah, or why should you have to pay for those batteries if you have to swap them out? If they delivered them uh, in a discharged state. Just just some of the things you should should pay close attention to. Uh, battery inspection. Um, very important to uh, look at your cables, examine the the condition of the cables. You can have the best charging system in the world on that vehicle, but if you cannot deliver that power to those batteries. What good does it do you? So really, you know, during the, the PM process, um, take cables off, inspect them, clean them uh, before you put them back on. Make sure you can get that power you know, from the alternator or the charging system to those batteries. Um, just looking at the battery itself, inspect the posts. Um, you know, make sure that is the primary electrical connection on a battery is that lead pad. Uh, so make sure it's, it's you know, even um, and in very good shape and clean before you put those cables back on. Um, examine the case for damage. Um, if it's cracked, at that point, it's, it's a boat anchor. Um, so really pay attention to your batteries. Um, kind of off topic, but uh, we talked about temperature, too, and, and uh, we could also be dealing with frozen batteries. So... Um, you know, flooded cell battery um, at a discharge state, you're going to have uh, just water sitting in the battery. So 32 degrees, what does water do? It freezes. So um, pay really close attention to that. Yeah, because that's, you know, a big thing that we're, you know, we're talking about, you know, is um, some of this equipment we don't know when it's going to go back in service. You know, uh, schools, for example, um, and they're not 100 percent sure if schools are going back in this fall yet. Um, so things could sit around until winter. So if you do have batteries or, you know, vehicles that have these parasitic loads and these batteries get down to that low, they are going to freeze. And not only now you have, you know, dead vehicles, but now you've got ruined batteries. That's when that uh, water inside the battery freezes, it's going to expand. You can uh, bust connections inside the batteries, all kinds of things. So if you ever run across a, a frozen battery, don't try to charge it. Don't do anything with it. Just get it out of the, the truck and, and throw it in the scrap pile. Absolutely. Um, another thing to take a look at, it's always a good practice to clean the top of your batteries. When you're in there, 
clean them off. Uh, don't let that dirt and grime you know, build up on the batteries because that could be the main, you know, one of the, the main causes for that battery uh, being discharged. Um, you get too much buildup, it can actually conduct across the positive and negative post, and that alone would be a parasitic load. So um, obviously this picture here is pretty excessive, but, you know, some application, that battery is exposed to, to the element. So make sure you clean off the battery. And one thing is I took that picture. That is from a very professional fleet um, that has a good maintenance program. But if you look at the, the top of those batteries, when you think the last time someone did a, a good PM on those batteries? Makes me wonder. Um, so have they been properly tested? Have they been, you know, properly checked? Um, nothing else is, you know, it's perception. That if a driver did have a, you know, electrical problem and his batteries look like that, I'd wonder if anyone did anything. Um, so, you know, I'm not ever going to say they're a Corvette and you got to spend three hours detailing them, but you do have to get all that slime and grime off. Um, the, the one thing, too, is about protectant spray. Um, years ago, I'd say never use it. If you use the right batteries, you didn't have the problem. Now, with all the chemical cocktails that are on today's highways, um, now it's, you do need to do something to protect that bare metal. What should you use? I don't care. As long as you're protecting that bare metal from the contaminants and corrosions, that's that's the, the big thing you want to do. And more importantly, when you do use that that protectant, clean the battery first. You know, I've, I've seen a lot of PMs where it includes, um, you know, that spray protectant, um, but it does no good to encapsulate all that dirt and grime by by spraying it over top of it. So, clean the connections first, then then apply the the protectant. So, just some examples of uh, some some different battery packs. Um, the first one here, you can see vice clamps were used um, to clamp the positive cable on. You can see some sulfation going on. Probably not a good setup there. Um, the middle one here, you got four different battery, or three different battery types. Um, and not just different models, but it's even different chemistry. There's two of them that are AGM and two of them are flooded cell. Yeah. You couldn't ask for a much more of a, a screwed up battery pack than that. And if I recall correctly, it was you and I that was working on that trailer. Yep. And they were all different ages. You know, that is a application that every time you turn around, you're going to have a battery fail. And people are going to keep swapping a battery and you're going to be chasing your tail forever. And it's typically, what, like a six-month yeah. difference. Um, and CCAs, too. You want to make sure your CCAs, um, if you are do have a battery program or a recharge program. Um, manufacturer needs to match. Uh, CCAs need to need to match. Um, and the dates need to be within a, a pretty short time period. Um, this one over here on the, um, the right here, um, you know, when I do do some of my training, um, this is one of the things that ever gets done. You see this battery configuration, you see the intercell connectors, where they have spots where you can connect in this, the middle of those inner cell connectors. Does anybody take those apart and clean them? Probably not. So uh, it's very important to, uh, going back to inspecting cables, if you have inner cell connectors like this, um, where there's connection points in the, the center of that inner cell connector, that's part of the electrical system as well. So make sure you uh, remove those cables, clean them you know, with battery brushes, um, during that PM process before you put it all back together. And we had a couple of comments come in. People said they couldn't see the pictures. Hopefully there's just a little bit of delay loading it because of the, the size of that slide. So uh, hopefully you can see them now. If not, if you do want to go back uh, tomorrow, you will be uh, sent the recorded version of this and you'll be able to see those pictures then. So going to, into your PM process, um, it's very easy to check a box. Um, you really need to uh, you know, pay close attention to, to your technicians and, and make sure they're, they're doing all the right things, make sure they're, they're filling out the PM sheets, but more importantly, make sure you enforce the action items. Um, you're not going to get a whole lot of value out of this PM sheet if you don't enforce um, all these action items. Improve the process to maximize results. Um, again, very easy to just check a box. Make sure they're doing it. So we got another poll question that came in. So what is the percent state of charge of a flooded cell battery at 12.4 volts? 
We have 75%, 25%, or 50%. And we'll give you a few seconds to uh, answer that poll question. We just got feedback that the pictures did come through now, so everybody can see them. So, no oh, good. That's probably enough time. So, the results came in. We got 72% say 75% state of charge, 2% uh, say 25%, and 25%. It's kind of funny saying 25 and then 50%. 25% <laughs> say 50% say the charge. The correct answer is 50% say the charge. 50% say the charge. But, but again, again, a lot of misconceptions about what you know a battery is. You know, we'll get tech calls come in and you say, hey, what's the batteries at? Oh, they're good. Well, what is good? Well, and apparently that usually means he's using a test light and it seems pretty bright to him. No. Um, you know, voltmeters is you know there for a reason to give you an, you know a, a, an honest answer. Um, but you know on a lot of these things, you know even low testing a battery, um, if a battery ain't at least sixty percent state of charge, you really can't test, test it. it. At least you can't do a low test on you know some of the electronic testers can tell you if a battery's good or bad. But you know you really want to you know try to find a leak in a tire if you only have ten pounds of pressure in it. No, it makes it a little difficult. So same thing with with batteries. You got to make sure they they are one hundred percent. Um, or at least a minimum uh, to do all the tests. But if you're going to park them, you want to make sure they're parked at 100%. So again, some of the solutions for you know park trucks. You know, and again, these are things that we've had lots of calls on lately. And the biggest one we have Jimmy talk about is solar. Yeah. So uh, one of the solar options uh, you know we have is a, we call it the solar dash. Um, essentially. We call it a dash because you just plug it into like a cigarette lighter um, and just throw it up in the dash. But you can also use it for uh, other applications like reefer applications to uh, kind of ca counteract, um, you know, telematics loads, any any loads. Um, but, yeah, it's designed to counteract parasitic loads. Um, so you, you park a, a truck um, at a discharge state, it may keep it there. Again, it's it's to counteract those loads. So... The goal is to park, park that vehicle. You know, add this solution, and it'll keep it there. It'll counteract all those loads and just keep it at that, um, that hundred percent state of charge that you should have parked that vehicle in. Um, go a little bit above that, and you know, we have a solar volt option um, that'll not only counteract those loads, but it'll go above that um, and give you a little bit more charging ability. So you can extend battery life. Um, you can also, with, with the technology we have built into our controller, um, you can reduce the electroload on the vehicle, thus realizing some, some fuel savings. Um, our technology, uh, basically, it'll, if it sees something else charging those batteries, most uh, solar controllers will go into like a maintain mode, um, where we'll actually go into, um, if we see something else charging, we don't want to go into maintain mode. We want to get the most out of those panels, so we'll bump our voltage up, push more current into those batteries. So that's less load on the vehicle, so there's a little bit of fuel savings cal calculated into that. But either way, we're going to keep the batteries charged or even supplement. And where we're seeing a lot more demand for the, the bigger solar is obviously you know trailer applications with like lift gates, but trailer or trucks uh, since uh, COVID, where uh, it's really kind of you know impacted drivers' hours and how they operate, you know they are stuck somewhere longer periods of time, and they're able to run all their you know devices for longer periods of time without having to run the engine to, to restart it when the the cab LVD starts shedding loads. So there's been some real pluses to adding solar to it. If you can't put more energy in to solve the problem. The other thing you got to do is you got to figure out how to, to plug all those holes. When we, when we talk about batteries, they're buckets. They're just buckets of energy, whether you got one bucket, two bucket, mm -hmm. you know, big buckets, small buckets, they're buckets. And all these parasitics are holes in those buckets. So if you can't pour more, you know, energy back into those buckets from another source, the only other thing you can do is figure out a way to start plugging those holes in the bucket. And 
that can be done with an LVD. Um, so some sort of a low voltage disconnect. Now again, the, the cabs usually do a pretty good job from the factory control those. It's all the things that get added. And the, the dual shield is something we actually made for the school bus industry because again, there is so many- So many holes. Yeah, there's so many devices that have been put on school buses uh, to make sure they protect kids and a lot of those companies have never really done a real good job of um, worrying about their parasitics, um, and they're pretty high. Mm -hmm. um, we've actually seen school buses that have five, six amp load the whole time. Um, doesn't take long to kill a battery pack if you got a five amp load on all the time. Um, but again, it's a way to plug those holes in and shut off those non-essential loads, you know, either by voltage or time to protect those batteries. And if you do nothing else, um parked vehicle sitting for long periods of time, disconnect that ground cable. Um, that's going to eliminate any, you know, any current draw off that battery. Um, most simple solution. Now, this was saying, you know, people don't want to spend any money, but you're spending money to, to fight this right now. Um, so it's either you, you add something to it or very much you're going to spend some, some labor to pull ground cables. Um, but it's the easiest thing to do. And we had a question before that, you know, if you did pull the, the cables, how long would it sit there? Um, there's still several factors to that. Um, it's kind of like we talk about shelf life of a battery. That how long can a battery sit on the shelf and maintain its charge and, you know, for a cell or, or whatever? Um, a flooded cell battery, you're probably around six months. Um, so if you had a, you know, a battery bank and you parked it at 100%, it'll probably stay at a, a good state of charge for six months. If you're talking about AGM, you're probably closer to a year. There's still lots of factors to that is um, if you don't clean them and they're still discharging through all the, the gunk on top, I'll still bet, you know, people, if you got batteries that look like you can grow corn on top of them, you probably need to do something about them because yeah. they are going to still, uh, still sit there and self-discharge. The other thing, too, is temperature. Um, the hotter it is, the faster that chemical reaction is going to happen and the faster batteries are going to self-discharge. Um, I'll tell people that if you got a Harley or you know something that you're going to park all winter, best thing you can do is charge it up to 100 percent, throw it in the freezer. Now, I tried that once. Um, wife wasn't real happy with my solution there, um, <laughs> but it does work because again, the colder that battery is, it slows down the reaction. The longer it's going to live. Um, you just got to you know make sure you take it out and warm it up. But mm -hmm. a fully charged you know uh, flooded cell battery is not going to freeze to. And there's some argument, but somewhere around 80 degrees below zero. A totally discharged battery where you've driven all that acid out of the, you know, quote unquote, electrolyte and into the plates, that battery is going to freeze just like water. So you do have to be careful. Um, but again, there are variables to that is how long it's going to sit. Um, but if you do truly have no parasitics and you, by disconnecting the ground cables or whatever, they can sit out there for months and not have an issue. And it's, you know, pay me now or pay me later that all these are going to cost you some money, it's just, you know, uh, what's it going to be worth to you long term? Yep. That, hey, yeah, I'm going to spend some time to, to, you know, for example, put a solar panel on. But then I'm done and I'm going to get the paybacks for years. Ground cable, well, you know, I got to remember to do it. Um, and it could cause you more headaches than, than it's worth, but yeah. it, it is still an option. And it may be a, uh, a fleet where they don't have maintenance personnel, mm -hmm. um, or it's just a drop yard or something. Well, now you may have to have an outside company do it or something. Uh, so, there, there's gives and takes to all of them, but all of them can address these issues. Um, if anyone's got any questions, again, please feel to, to chime in. Um, go to the, the magic question mark screen. Um, also, stick around um, until the end of the webinar for a uh, survey. Yes, we do try to always ask you, you know, some questions, follow up on these. You know, we do these to uh, be an asset to the industry. Um, the industry has been good to us. We want to give back and support any way we can. Um, I always look at the, all the, the attendees list, and there's a lot of friends and, and industry counterparts that are on here. So um, uh, we do ask you to do uh, follow up. If you have any questions, Jimmy's contact, my contact information, both are in the, the, the resource folder as well. Um, if you typed any questions, anything we missed, we'll follow up with you and uh, uh, see if there's anything we do. Um, or again, uh, suggestions for future webinars. We try to do these once a month. So, uh, if there's a hot topic out there that you guys want to uh, 
want to know a little bit more about, send you know, send us your suggestions. And other than that, we are going to send it then back to the end in the, uh, the survey. Survey. Thanks again, everyone, for attending. Thank you, everyone.